the passage where the Buddha describes his knowledge of the fate of other people, or the destinations of other people. He says it's like watching a man walking along a path that doesn't fork off in any other direction. It goes straight to one destination. And you notice if, if the man continues to follow that path, he's going to end up at that destination. Notice it's contingent on the man's continuing on that path. Because after all, the man might have the choice not to follow that path, change his mind, turn around. There's another passage where the Buddha is asked, is everybody going to go to awakening? Is the whole world going, half the world? And he refuses to answer. Ananda, who's afraid that the man who asked the question is going to get upset, takes the man aside and says, it's like a gatekeeper to a fortress. There's only one gate to the fortress. The gatekeeper walks around the fortress. He doesn't see even the slightest opening in the fortress wall, not even one big enough for a cat to slip through. So it comes to the conclusion that he doesn't know how many people are going to come into the fortress, how many people will leave the fortress, but he does know if they're going to come in or leave, it has to be through the gate. And the point here is that we have the choice to follow the path. We have the choice to go into the gate or not go into the gate. It's up to us. And it is a free choice. It's not imposed on us by our nature. We have to will it. Awakening is something that you get onto the path through your desire for awakening. It's an act of will. It's a truth of the will. William James talks about truths of the observer, truths of the will. The truth of the observer is the type where you see cause and effect that are totally independent of your desire for them to be in a certain way. Knowledge about astronomy, knowledge about the laws of nature. You have to take your desire out of the equation. You have to be as much as possible a non-interfering observer. When you interfere a little bit here and there in order to test cause and effect to exactly what is what cause is connected to what effect. But you have to accept the results, whether you like them or not. And if your likes get in the way, you're not really going to see those truths. Truths of the will, however, are a different kind entirely. You have to want them to be true in order for them to become true. If you want to become a pianist, you want to become a good carpenter, you have to want it in order for it to happen. It helps if you have some natural inclination in that direction or some natural talents. But to be really good, you have to have a strong desire. Without that desire, it's not going to happen. In this case, your likes and dislikes are important. They're actually a nature of the part of the truth. And this is the way it is with a path. We're not here just simply arise, watching things passively. Because what, what we're learning is not a truth of the observer, it's a truth of the will. Awakening is something that has to be pursued. The death, of course, is not created by a desire, but the path is. It's something fabricated. And you look at the qualities that lead to awakening, things like the, the Ten Perfections. They come under the headings of what the Buddha talks of as Atitana Dhamma, things that are willed. Actually four. There's discernment, truth, relinquishment, and peace, or calming. And all of these things are the things that we have to will. 
in order to find them. Now the problem with the will, of course, is that it can be blind, which is why discernment comes first. You want to will discernment for it to happen. It's not a question of whether you're born smart or, smart or not born smart. But discernment is composed of two qualities. One is having conviction. Again, this is where that issue of the truth of the will comes in. You have to be convinced that this is a worthwhile activity, trying to develop your discernment, trying to find awakening. That it is possible. If you don't believe it's possible, it's not going to happen. It's like the person stuck in the woods. If you don't believe that there's a path out, you're not going to try to look for it. And of course, if you don't try to look for it, you're not going to find it. So conviction that your actions really do make a difference, conviction that the Buddha really did gain awakening, these are an important part of discernment. You look at the five strengths which end in discernment, but they begin with conviction. As one of my Johns in Thailand once said, it's, it's not the case that discernment begins with perceptions or ideas or concepts. It begins with conviction that there is a way out and that it can be found through your own actions. The other aspect of discernment is that you see what are the important qualities to look for, realizing what the important questions are. And as the Buddha said, the question is seeing where there's suffering, where there's stress, what's causing it, and what actions put an end to it. Realizing that those are the important questions in life. And you need to learn how to focus on those. And that cuts through a lot of garbage. And then you look at those qualities that need to be followed in order to put an end to suffering, you find there are also qualities that are required to improve your discernment. You need to develop more mindfulness, more alertness, more concentration. And part of that quest for the end of suffering involves goodwill. Goodwill for yourself, goodwill for the people around you. Because you realize that if your happiness depends on their suffering, it's not going to happen. They're not going to get in the way. So you have to find a happiness that's harmless to everybody. So that's the first thing you will. It's the will to discernment helps you see what goal is a good goal and also what way clearly is the good way, because you're going to have to learn a lot of this path on your own as you go along. It's something you discover. All too often reread the books saying that it's going to be like this, you're going to gain this insight, you're going to gain that insight, and you can for force the mind into such a position that it starts having those insights. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're true. You have to learn how to be more observant, more alert, look all around you. As John Lee once said, when, when you gain an insight, you have to turn it over to see what extent it really is true, to what extent is it false, to what extent would the opposite be true, so that you know that you're not just programming yourself or trying to clone what you've read. And that would be a case of trying to make your discernment grow from your concepts, as, from, as opposed to a, the conviction there's got to be a way out. and that you've got to find it for yourself with the Buddha's directions, but it's, it's based on your own powers of mindfulness and alertness, so you catch yourself that your defilements don't get in the way. So we will discern it. The next thing we will is truthfulness. And part of this is that quality of self-honesty, the Buddha said, a man comes who is honest and no deceiver, truthful and no deceiver. And the Buddha says, I will teach that person the Dharma. This is the first prerequisite for getting on the path, is to be truthful. And it's not just 
telling the truth, but it also means deciding what you've got to do and sticking with it, being true to your intentions. This is where the precepts or virtue as a perfection comes in. Once you've realized that you don't want to harm anybody, you've got to follow through and really abstain from activities that are harmful, whether it's easy to abstain or not. And this is where your discernment comes in, and it's practical side. When you find that a precept goes against your desires, you've got to find ways of making yourself want to stick with it, making it easier to stick with it, learning to cast a jaundiced eye on your desires. Realizing they promise all kinds of things, but can you really trust them? So you have to use your discernment to stay true to your intention and to find skillful ways to take the wind out of the sails of your unskillful desires. So you can hang on to what you know is really in your best interest, the best interest of the people around you. The third thing that we have to will is relinquishment, learning how to let go. This is where the perfection of generosity comes in, the perfection of giving. It means not just giving away material things, but learning to give up our unskillful desires, give up our unskillful ways of holding on to things. And some kind, sometimes it comes naturally, it comes easily, and sometimes it doesn't. And again, this is where your discernment comes in. make you more and more inclined to give up the things you have to give up. Things that get in the way, the lesser pleasures. And it's not a matter of just giving up things that are obviously unskillful. I did a survey one time on the topic of relinquishment in books. American books of American Buddhism, and usually they would talk about relinquishing unhealthy relationships and relinquishing your controlling mindset. We don't need the Buddha to tell you to relinquish those things. Your parents can tell you to relinquish unhealthy relationships, and if you have a psychotherapist, they'll, the therapist will tell you to relinquish your controlling mindset. I mean, there are a lot of things that are really pleasurable that society actually encourages you to look for, but the Buddha says, look, you've got to give them up. Because they lead to unhealthy attachments down the line. Your attachment to sensual pleasures, that's the big one. Or your attachment to thoughts about, plans about sensual pleasures. That's what renunciation is all about. And learning to see the rewards of renunciation, it really is restful to the mind, it really gives peace to the mind. There's that famous story about the monk sitting in the forest saying, what bliss, what bliss. And it turns out he's not pining after his joys that he felt when he was a king before he became a monk. It's he's blissful now that he can sit under the tree without having to worry about all the people who wanted to kill him when he was a king, all the people who wanted to take away the pleasures that he had. The pleasure of renunciation. There's nobody who's going to try to steal that from you. And as the monk said, his mind was now like a wild deer. It was free. You've got to learn how to think in those ways when the desire for sensuality really gets strong. To see that if you can renounce it, you're free. And again, you have to will that. It doesn't come naturally, as the Buddha once said. Even he didn't find it easy to will renunciation. His mind didn't leap up at the idea. 
but its desire for a deathless happiness was strong enough. And it was coupled with the discernment that he was trying to develop, that he could find ways of reasoning with his mind, find tactics for giving the mind pleasures that didn't have to depend on sensuality, primarily the, the pleasure of jhana, the pleasure of concentration. And when you have an alternative source of pleasure like that, then you realize that you're, you're trading candy for gold. This, too, is something you have to will. The fourth thing is peace. The Pali word upasama means stilling or calm. And there are two perfections that are associated with that. One is patience and the other is equanimity. Patience can, the word patience can also mean endurance, that you put up with difficult things, which means that you learn not to focus on the difficulty, but to find ways of encouraging yourself, giving yourself energy. Again, it's closely related to relinquishment and renunciation. You learn how to see the areas, the advantages of enduring. The mind becomes stronger. It can live in more difficult situations. It's not such a slave to its, its desires as it was before. There's a freedom that comes with endurance. And equanimity. This, too, is something you have to will. The ability to stay with things that you like, things that you don't like. Not get excited when things go well, not get depressed when they don't go well. And it's training yourself to have a certain amount of independence. And it's the equanimity that it improves your discernment as well. The two qualities go hand in hand. Because there are times in the meditation where you do simply have to sit and watch. Some of your defilements really will go away just when you watch them, but not all of them. And one of the points of developing equanimity is so you begin to see the difference. So it's not a blank, blanket passivity that the Buddha is recommending. You develop equanimity when it's appropriate. You develop equanimity when you need to see things that you don't yet understand. And then the understanding comes, okay, when equanimity is still appropriate and when you need to you're something more forceful. All of these are things that we have to will. Now we're free to will them or free not to. This is why the Buddha never talked about Buddha nature. The idea that somehow our inherent nature is going to lead us to awakening. We have freedom, though, the freedom to choose. And the Buddha was a great respecter of that freedom. Because it's a little bit scary to think about the fact that awakening is not inevitable. But it's important we have that heedfulness that comes with realizing okay, we are free to choose, and we can make right choices, and we make wrong choices, and we have to live with the consequences. But that heedfulness is what lies at the basis of all that's skillful. So if you can develop that and learn how to live with that and not get scared by it, learn how to make it energizing so that it keeps you alert. But learning how to develop that sense of patience and equanimity, the calm that goes well so that it goes along with this, so that the effort of the path doesn't get you all frazzled and worn out. So these are the qualities that we will on the path. These are the qualities that lead to awakening. And if we learn how to respect our freedom as well, then that puts us on the path so we understand what's going on. Because an important part of awakening is finally coming to something that is not willed at all. But you're not going to really see it. You're not going to be able to test it and understand what's willed and what's not willed until you learn to understand your will very thoroughly, how far it goes, what subtle levels of willing can happen in the mind. And 
as you push the envelope. So ultimately this willed path, this truth of the will, does finally lead to something that is totally unwilled. One of the paradoxes of the teaching, but one that the Buddha is very upfront about. We're looking for something unfabricated, but you have to fabricate the path. He said the highest of all fabrications, which is another word for the highest of all things you can will, is the Eightfold Path. There is a Dhamma that's higher than that. It's totally unwilled. It's dispassion, disenchantment. The rest that comes when you put in the energy that's needed to will the path in a skillful way. So what this means is that the choice is up to us which path we're going to follow. For there are many paths. There's a path that leads to hell, there's a path that leads to the animal rebirth, there's a path that leads to the human rebirth, the divine birth, and there's a path that leads to total awakening. The Buddha set them out. It's up to us to choose.